And wait, what? No, I don't need that. Let's see, Taylor is here. Anybody else gets here, let me know. Uh, okay, I have shared the screen yet. Oh. All right, can you all see my screen? Yes. yes. Great. I think Tell you this. Mm -hmm. Ah, here we go. Um so the first thing to notice about a supermarket in California is it is a farm with super long lines. Normally we don't see them printed out the way they uh, were intended, but I've done that here. You see, it just goes on and on. So uh, this line, what thoughts I have of you tonight, Walt Whitman, for I walked down the supermarket under the trees with a headache, self-conscious, looking at the full moon. That is one line. We're not gonna do the whole thing that way. Um, but he's, this puts him in the tradition. Uh, where's my PowerPoint? Thank you. 
edition of Walt Whitman, who wrote Leaves of Grass, his uh, major poem in 1856. It's actually a collection of poems. <clears throat> and in it, Whitman is experimenting with a new idea about poetry. Traditional English language poetry uh, is uh, marked by uh, the meter, which has to do with the length of the line and with the rhyme scheme. And he throws both of these out and says, uh, what if I just write really long sentences uh, and those will be uh, my uh, poetry. So uh, here we have a long first line, line one, this is line two. Oops. This is line three and so on. And he's writing in that style 100 years later, 1956. And he's using the Whitman style, but also uh, some of the Whitman uh, ethos, some of the Whitman spirit. Uh, Walt Whitman was a, a poet who celebrated. Uh, American diversity. Uh, he's the poet of uh, the frontiersman out in the West. He's the poet of the North. He's the poet of the South. Uh, in a time when we were impinging on a civil war, it's just four years later to the civil war, and he's trying to hold all of these parts together with all of its diversity, and that's what makes us a genius. You know, that's the genius of America. Uh, we seesaw between two extremes, the America of diversity and the America of conformity. And the 50s were a wild swing toward conformity. Everybody doing the same thing, everybody believing the same thing. Uh, it was, um, so Taylor Smith and Rivet are here. So um, well, Whitman uh, uh, was a poet of diversity. So is uh, Allen Ginsberg. Living in this age of conformity where uh, everybody is trying to do the same thing all the time. Um, and 156 years later, he's uh, thinking back on Walt Whitman in the uh, lost America of love, the America that he celebrated uh, that seems to be so gone now. Uh, and why is Ginsburg uh, such a poet of diversity in an era of conformity. Well, he's a guy who simply, by his very, who he is, he cannot conform. Uh, he's a gay guy, uh, pretty much openly gay. Uh, he is, um, grew up a communist. And the 50s were a time when uh, the American right was uh, cracking down on the American left. Um, everybody who had ever had anything to do with communism uh, was on the outs. But anybody who was any left at all was uh, viewed with a lot of suspicion. You had to prove that you weren't 
uh, a communist. Are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party in this hysteria? And we forget that a mere 30 years earlier, capitalism collapsed. It had failed uh, massively. A third of the country uh, out of work and on the move, uh, dust bowl. I mean, in some ways, similar to our own time, um, when uh, the economy has once again collapsed and uh, what was it, 30 million Americans, 60 million in the last six months have been without a job. Uh, not that many unemployed now, but that's a lot of people losing work over a six month period, plus a pandemic uh, that we can't figure out how to deal with. And um, in a time like that, people start looking for other answers. And one of them was fascism, but another was communism or uh, its milder uh, socialist forms. And a lot of people in the 50s were like Allen Ginsberg, uh, coming of age, having uh, grown up in the American left. And now that's looked on with suspicion. He's also an atheist. He's also Jewish. He also uses uh, drugs. Um, by the end of his life, he was an American icon. Um, and uh, this one of my friends I taught with uh, some years ago, um, when she was in grad school, he was still alive. That's how old I am, uh, that Ginsburg was alive still when I was in grad school. But, uh, he came to her grad school and it was a big deal. So they you know, had him stand with one of the professors and they had him, uh, you know, a party in his honor. And uh, the next day, the professor gets up, and you know, the house is a mess. Walking around, but Allen Ginsberg isn't there, and he's lost America's greatest living poet, <laughs> and he's starting to panic. And so, you know, he goes through all the rooms in the house, the garage. He's not there. Starts looking around the yard, and had some of these big architectural rocks in his front yard, and. There was a naked Allen Ginsberg curled around one of the rocks, passed out, and uh, the guy said, uh, Mr. Ginsberg, are you okay? And he said, and opened his eyes and looked up at him and said, I am becoming one with the rocks. <laughs> he never changed. Uh, he stayed the way he was. And also, uh, he had a very foul language. He doesn't use it here, but he uses it in a lot of poetry and uh, as a student at uh, Columbia, uh, he had uh, gotten tired of the maid not properly dusting. Imagine for a moment, uh, tech sending maids in to clean up your dorm room as an apartment. So those were the days, except his maid wasn't doing a very good job. So he put essentially wash me, but with some profanity mixed in or, or dust me on the windowsill. And uh, she brought in the authorities. She narked him out, brought in the uh, powers to be at Columbia, and they kicked him out of school. So all of this stuff um, So uh, this is a period when uh, uh, how can we do this? We're going to put him over in diversity here. There we go. Berg and Whitman both. Diversity. Okay, so what's the America of conformity like in 1956? Well, for one thing, Straight, very, very straight, almost gay and so straight. Um, you had to, you know, the John Wayne look or the man in the suit, the gray suit or the blue suit. Um, it's not that there weren't gay people, it's that it being caught being gay was very bad for your life and for your career. Uh, so much so uh, that uh, the red panic, which led to people uh, searching for uh, communists everywhere. They actually found a lot more 
uh, uh, gay people than they found communists. So it was almost, uh, you know, the witch hunt for reds was also a witch hunt for pinks. And so you had to uh, look very straight in order to keep your job. Of course, uh, your um, American capitalism, whatever that is. Um, um, this is the decade when they stuck under God into the Pledge of Allegiance. It had not been there at first. Uh, it was written by a good Baptist minister who, uh, as a good Baptist minister, believed in separation of church and state. And so he didn't put under God into his uh, Pledge of Allegiance. But uh, the uh, publicly godly people uh, did, uh, at this point, we're still mostly Protestant Christians. Uh, it will be Kennedy, who is the uh, first and so far last Roman Catholic president. I think there's not been any others. Uh, but he'll kind of break that barrier down in 1960. Um, well, there were drugs, uh, eh, lots of alcohol, pills, uh, but none of that reefer, you know, this is uh, the period when um, illegal drugs were just uh, regarded as, you know, they were uh, very far beyond the pale. Um, yeah, you know. You're supposed to be polite in your language. Uh, use uh, good words, uh, not the bad words. Uh, if you're going to use a bad word, you go out behind the shed and use it. Uh, don't let anybody hear it. You certainly don't put it into your poetry. All right, so uh, this is uh, Walt Whitman, the background to this poem. And one reason he goes back and dusts off a uh, hundred year old Walt Whitman is he doesn't feel like any of the poetry of the day speaks for him. He needs this guy that's speaking for American diversity. Let's take a look at the poem. What thoughts I have of you tonight, Walt Whitman, for I walked down the side streets under the trees with a headache, self-conscious looking at the full moon. I tried to make it on one breath, but simply couldn't do it. So, uh, in his thoughts on this 100 year anniversary, he's walking under the side streets of his California town, under trees, he's got a headache, probably hung over. He's just getting up, uh, it's early evening and you know, he slept the day away because, um, oh yeah. Uh, the 50s are a decade that you go to bed at uh, nine o'clock, maybe. Uh, in my hungry fatigue and shopping for images, I went into the neon fruit supermarket dreaming of your enumerations. Now, the uh, modern grocery store is a new innovation. Uh, if you want to see what, how people used to get their groceries, a uh, good place to go would be the old French market in New Orleans. Um, if I can get this to please open up. There we go. All right, and so you would uh, go in at one end, and uh, there's a guy selling tomatoes and cucumbers. Another person's selling carrots. Uh, there's a section where they sell meat, by which they mean live chickens walking around. Um, <laughs> uh, you've got to, you know, the step one to making fried chicken is killing the chicken. Or uh, they would uh, butcher the meat right there for you. It was notoriously uh, dirty. Um, and um, 
you know, if you had leftover, like a little bit of cabbage left over at the end of the day, you would just throw it out into the ditch out back and it would pile up there for a long time. Uh, and so, um, yeah, uh, that was the way people made groceries back in the day. And here's this new American innovation, the, uh, the, the supermarket, the uh, grocery store. And it's clean and it's got clean floors and clean ceilings. And you don't have uh, trash lying around a few feet from the food. Uh, it's a brand new thing. It's transforming the way people shop in the United States. Although there are many countries in the world that to this day shop in the old uh, markets like uh, the French market in New Orleans. That's the way vast, probably the majority of people in the world still get their groceries. And these farmers bring their food in or somebody that works for them brings their food in and sells it. And yesterday it was in the field. Today we have this long uh, chain between us and the food and we've become alienated from uh, the food uh, its source. Uh, we don't know the farmer who grows it. Um, so at the same time, it's a great convenience. It's also part of the alienation of modern American society. Um, you don't get to know the people that are behind your food. And it makes it easier to demonize them when the time comes. It's hard to demonize the person in the apron selling you uh, uh, potatoes every day. Uh, when you never see them, yeah, we can uh, make them out to be terrible people. Now, what is an enumeration? An enumeration is the action of mentioning a number of things one by one. Right in the middle of the word, is buried the word numeral, number. Um, and this was something Whitman liked to do was list things. And immediately after he talks about an enumeration, he does an enumeration. So this is an enumeration. Uh, we should be able to, how do we go? Oh, hello. Long line, remember? All right, let's make it. What peaches? What penumbras? Whole family shopping at night. Aisles full of husbands. Wives in the avocados. Babies in the tomatoes. And you, Garcia Lorca, what were you doing down by the watermelon? So we have a list and enumeration of seven things. Um, and actually, we start like putting in multiple things at the same time. Uh, families, aisles, and husbands, wives, avocados. Those are more, you know, each one of these is two. Babies, tomatoes, Garcia Lorca, watermelons. Garcia Lorca was a famous... Spanish poet who wrote in the Walt Whitman style and happened to be gay. So, uh, you know, if you're going to see somebody, if, I, if we were going to see somebody in the grocery store who was dead, by this time he's dead, it would probably be Elvis by the donuts. But uh, in this case, we've got Garcia Lorca by the watermelons. Yeah. Um, by the way, what is a penumbra? This is an important word for this poem. Uh, remember that full moon we were talking about a minute ago? Every now and then, uh, the earth will come between the sun and the moon and cast a shadow. And the full shadow for the total eclipse is called an umbra. It's the Latin word for shadow. It's where we get the word umbrella, which is designed to 
cast a little shadow over us. When you get a half of an eclipse, then you're in part of the shadow, but not all of it. And that's the penumbra. It's a half shadow. If you ever noticed in a, a grocery store or place, you know, like our classrooms that we have uh, on the rare occasions, we're able to go there. And we've got rows and rows of bright fluorescent lights. And that means you have a half shadow. You have to get your hand really close down to the floor to create a full shadow that's blocking out the light uh, from all directions. It is, uh, in the store, we get half light. Now, I've often wondered, and this is my pet theory, I, I don't think I've read it anywhere, which means I don't have any real scholarly. Um, but when we bring up the word shadow, um, it can imply the shadow of death. Um, I'm not sure that he is here. Um, the valley of the shadow of death in Psalm 23. Uh, and it may be that even in the grocery store uh, with its bright lights, uh, we're in the half shadow of death. So, you know, the, we're not totally out of it. And there is a kind of seriousness to this poem. It's, it's not a happy poem, even though it's kind of silly at times. I saw you, Walt Whitman, childless, lonely old grubber, poking among the meats in the refrigerator and eyeing the grocery boys. So uh, Walt Whitman is there. He's um, down in the refrigerated section where they've got the meat uh, cut up and wrapped, shrink wrapped so that uh, it stays fresh and he's uh, looking in there. But he's really there to check out the grocery boys because um, Whitman was famously ambiguous in his sexuality. Uh, he celebrated uh, female sexuality, but also masculine sexuality in very, uh, what could be alarming ways to um, uh, people who were um, uh, oh, what's it? homophobic, yeah. Um, so uh, he's making him in his imagination full on uh, gay like him. Um, which you can do. I heard you asking questions of each. Who killed the pork chops? What price bananas? Are you my angel? So the first two are uh, you know, questions you might ask uh, just to find out information. The last one is, uh, come on, uh, are you going to be my angel? What time do you get off? How about some coffee? Maybe one of those donuts if we can get Elvis away from it. I wandered in and out of the brilliant stacks of cans following you and followed in my imagination by the store detective. Well, uh, what do we call a store detective today? Anybody got a guess? Just chime in. A security guard? Yes. So, uh, yeah, the security guard is following them around. Walt Whitman shows up in your grocery store. So uh, you're in a California uh, grocery store. Uh, the uh, security guard or the manager, manager sees this guy walk in and start hanging out with Oh, uh, this is how he would have looked in the 50s. Uh, this is how he looked later. <laughs> so uh, you see those two guys in your grocery store. Uh, you're going to go up to the uh, security guard and say, uh, uh, dude, uh, follow those two guys around. I'm not sure what they're up to. They've been 
messing with the grocery boys. Uh, gotta, gotta check these guys out. So anyway, here they go. And uh, in the very next line, they're walking through the store eating all the food and not paying for it. Um, so he's forgot, it didn't take him long to forget about the store detective. But this is a fantasy, right? We strode down the open corridors together in our solitary fancy, tasting artichokes, possessing every frozen delicacy, and never passing the cashier. I mean, that's the American Eden, right? Uh, getting stuff and uh, never having to pay for it. So now we leave the store. Where are we going, Walt Whitman? The doors close in an hour. Which way does your beard point tonight? I touch your book and dream of our odyssey in the supermarket and feel absurd. So he leaves the poem for a minute because what is actually going on? He's actually, of course, at home with the book of Walt Whitman sitting by his piece of paper. He's either typing or handwriting on it. I don't know which he did. Uh, but he's actually working on a poem about him and Walt Whitman. He's not really living this fantasy. It is a fantasy. It is a dream. And we're going to call it an odyssey. Uh, because an odyssey, going back to the Iliad and the Odyssey, is a story about a quest. And what's his quest for? Um, it seems to be a quest to me for not only love, but for a connection with people. He's, he's there, but he's not part of the families. Um, he feels more comfortable with dead poets than he does living people. We, when we walk all night through solitary streets, the trees add shade to shade, lights out in the houses, we'll both be lonely. And here's that loneliness again. And no longer do we have the bright garish lights. Uh, instead, we're out in the dark. Of course, uh, when you're under a full moon, it's not all that dark. So we get under some trees and uh, we add a shade or darkness on top of it. This is full shadow here. And so he'll be lonely. Uh, now the 60s, the 50s were a bad time for Allen Ginsberg. Uh, the 60s and 70s, though, he came into his own a whole new generation uh, of hippies. Uh, it's spelling it wrong. Here we go. Okay, here's Allen Ginsberg in a happening. Uh, he looks a lot happier to me. Um, and of course, um, that can depend some on your drug situation, but also uh, the 50s, 60s swung back hard in the other direction. It's a real reaction to the 50s and the repression, uh, the hyper, you know, super tightly wound uh, decade. Uh, He's got friends now, and they too feel uh, this constriction is wrong for them. Of course, these hippies are now your grandparents, so you can ask them about the 60s sometime. And uh, that's what we'll say. Eh, what? I don't really remember that much about the 60s. Hippies? What do you mean, hippies? <laughs> um, so his time is coming, but it's not the 50s. The 50s is a very lonely decade for Allen Ginsberg. Will we stroll dreaming of the lost America of love past blue automobiles and driveways home to our silent cottage? What 
this is working to the suburbs, but he's living in a cottage. So, uh, Kind of looks like. So there we go, just a little shack, not that romantic. Um, but here's what's happening around him. Americans are moving out of the city, out of apartments following World War II. There was this uh, push toward home ownership you can live in a nice small house, but build an equity in it, which you can eventually sell and make money off of it. And it's the chief source of wealth for um, most ordinary Americans. If they uh, have any wealth at all, it's tied up in their house. And these original houses, there might be four models. Like here's model one, two, three. Well, looks like you're back at, uh, oh, it's three. One, two, three, one, two, three. Um, I used to live in a neighborhood where the house behind ours and up to was just exactly the same house that we were living in. And it was weird, like uh, I never went in it, but just looking at it from the road, it's like, that's my house. I wonder what they, you know, how they have it made decorated and stuff like that. So uh, the way they kept them cheap was you didn't get fancy with it, right? And so he's walking, 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 and finally winding up back at his silent cottage. Uh, but uh, this American suburbia is alienating to a guy like him who can't live in the same house as a third of the people on your street, <laughs> you know, like one every three houses. Exactly the same. He needs a little more diversity than that. Ah, uh, father, dear father, graybeard, lonely old courage teacher. What America did you have when Karen quit pulling his ferry and you got out on a smoking bank and stood watching the boat disappear on the black waters of Lethe? So Karen is the guy who takes you across the Lethe River. Let's see if that one I get these. That one you just got Karen. And uh, he takes you into the main part of the underworld. Now, if you touch the waters of Lethe, it's the river of forgetfulness and you forget. And so um, if you want to remember who you are, you've got to pay him. And that's why they would put uh, coins on your eyes when you died. Uh, so you could take the spirit of the coin uh, to the other side and pay Karen to take you across the river. Uh, so it's just a really poetic way of saying, what America did you have when you died? But that's not poetic. What do we mean by that? Did he have the America of diversity or was he still in the land, or was he in the land of conformity or the land of diversity? Um, and that's always a seesaw in our country. One of the first things that happened in our colonial history were the witch trials of 1692, um, which is all about conformity, right? And we have these panics ever so often where we crack down on diversity. Uh, I mean, just over the last you know, period of my lifetime, uh, there was the comic book moral panic. Um, these moral panics that we have and uh, comic books, really bad for the kids, movies, uh, TV shows, uh, computer games. Uh, before that, of course, uh, rock and roll. And uh, even worse, the rap came along later. But uh, if you go back over the last, you know, several decades, you find us always 
you know, from time to time in periods, uh, reacting to things we see in the world around us with this panic and outrage and freaking out and uh, because it's encouraging people to be different. Um, now we have, um, you know, in America where, uh, you know, the, the two are kind of at a fever pitch, the American conformity and the America of diversity, um, because it's clear that uh, the diversity is winning, but the conformity people are freaking out and trying to uh, roll it back. We've got the uh, handmaiden Amy Coney Barrett running uh, not only to uh, end abortion rights, but also uh, probably undo uh, gay marriage uh, and a lot of other stuff to try to push us back into a period of conformity. Uh, and so it's not that one of these wins uh, forever. We get ahead uh, in one area and then there's a backlash from the other area. And so it's a continual seesawing uh, throughout our history, uh, just changing the focus from time to time. All right, any questions? Okay, so if we're going to write about this, um, this, uh, A good uh, um, poem to talk about a comparison and contrast. We also have that possibility with uh, Sylvia Plath and Daddy. You know the contrast between her and her father. Here it's between the America of conformity and the America of diversity. And so you can uh, spend a paragraph talking about the things that are diverse in this poem, and then the things that are conforming. Um, even his conformity is a bit strange. You know, uh, wives in the avocados. Well, we know they mean wives standing by the avocados, but it, it gives you this image of well, women rolling around in avocados, babies rolling around in tomatoes. At least Garcia Lorca is standing by the watermelons. Um, but, you know, the security guard, the store detective is part of the you know conformity, not paying for food, certainly diversity. Trying to get a little of that communism going for him. Um, you can also talk about you know his loneliness in a paragraph in his quest for companionship. Even though he's not talking to the people, he wants to be around people. And sometimes that can make you a little less lonely. Sometimes it makes you more lonely because you're around them, but you're not with them. Um, okay, so you can also come up with, of course, any number of your own uh, um, outlines if you decide to write about this. And you, you, you can write about any of the poems we've read. Which are, uh, Mending Wall, Daddy, uh, Tennyson's Ulysses, Dante's Ulysses, or Supermarket in California. All right, any questions about the uh, poetry essay? So those are the only poems that we can write on? Yes. Like we could... okay. What did you have in mind? Uh, I was thinking about an Edgar Allan Poe poem. Let's stick with one of these since we've been over them in class. Um, okay. Um, you could write about Poe for your research paper if you want to. Have you made a turn it in on middle for this yes, essay? Yes, I just did that right before class. So let's see. 
So it's going to be due on November 2nd. And when's the research paper going to be due? Whoa, did we say? I thought we said, uh, let's see. Yeah, the turn it in says November 2nd. I don't think it does. But let's see. Where is a uh, fuck? All right, let's get back into Moodle. All right, where is it? Poetry essay. Oh my, I'm glad you noticed that. Because I did set it. I need to grade these this weekend. I always go by what we see in class because I'm for shit trying to <laughs> trying to set this. I know I said it. I know I did because I specifically like, okay. All right, but let's check. Um, yeah, we said the 30th, so y'all would have uh, Halloween to do fun stuff and not write a poetry essay. Uh, so uh, Friday by midnight, and then that'll give me the weekend to grade it because I'm not planning to do anything fun. Maybe a little bit of fun. <laughs> All right, anything else? Can you go over what the 10 sources are for our research paper again? Yes. Uh, number one, let's go ahead and put that on. OK, primary source, at least one. And what is a primary source? Anybody remember that? All right, your primary source is the thing you're writing about. So in this case, the story or poem or stories or poems, uh, plural, if you're writing about more than one. Uh, secondary sources, uh, I won't, Eight from a JSTOR. I do not want Wikipedia. I do not want essaysorus.com. It's not cheating to use them. It's just bad scholarship. Um, and you want to be excellent scholars when you leave here. Um, and then one definition. Do you remember where I want that from? Did we talk about this? The uh, it was, I can't remember the exact name of the, is it the, the, the dictionary? I can't remember which one you'd said. Oxford English Dictionary. Yes, that one. Uh, inscribe it on your heart. You want this for the future. We want to get a real definition. Um, so uh, at least one primary source, and if you have two primary sources, that means you can cut your eight from JSTOR to seven. Uh, now, do y'all remember how to get into JSTOR and the OED? Should we go through that again? Yes, please. All right. So you can go to LaTeX Library. And there we go. Don't click here, click down here, databases. And O for Oxford, not D for dictionary, O for Oxford, make a note for that. That's a tech alphabetizing for you. What is a penumbra? Then you click, you want the full entry. And over here, you want show all, not hide all. So you will have uh, pronunciation. Let's see if this works. Penumbra. Oh. Penumbra. 
Penumbra. Well, how about that? Inflections? Penumbri. Ah, penumbri. Oh, it's a plural. Okay. Um, etymology, and then a partially shaded area, uh, which you can go with that one, or you can, if you're needing more words to fill out your, uh, you know, uh, how many words is it? 2100. Twenty three hundred. So if you're needing more words to get to twenty three hundred, uh, you can uh, bulk this up. If it gets to be longer than three lines in your text, go ahead and block quote it. And uh, it can. I mean, there there are a lot of these. Ah, a little OED lore for you. Uh, the first edition was written uh, starting in the late 1800s and going into the 1900s. It came out with volume A, volume B, and so on until they got to Z. Uh, the second edition came out in 1988, and they've been working on the third edition ever since. So if you have something like this was probably the 1988 version, and so they have updated it. They've added that, and so this is the third edition. Uh, the most current form, and not a, you know, they're going through words a little bit long. Eventually, they'll get them all done, but this is one that's been worked over rather recently. C92, that's new. 90, that's third edition. 99, third edition. Two. So they're just trying to show uh, current examples. And some of these are still the first edition. So your most recent uh, date that it's been used to be 1865, and oh my goodness. Uh, but they haven't necessarily quit using the word, they just stopped, um, uh, haven't updated it to third edition. Yet. All right, any questions about OED? Uh, uh, Dr. Dean. Yes. So we had said, so eight sources, or I'm sorry, 10 sources. Right. Um, and I can't remember if you had stated how many uh quotations you'd like to see was did you say something about per paragraph i can't recall I... per body paragraph two brief quotations from the primary source and two brief quotations from your secondary sources and two okay. plus two equals four Perfect. yes there you go four <laughs> all right uh if you've forgotten the lecture you can replay it uh i've got the uh, video of it Posted, so you can watch us grading that guy's uh, award-winning. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say award-winning. His uh, actually, it was supposed to be an average uh, essay, so it would have wrong stuff to point out. But you know, sometimes he has one, two. Uh, seldom does he have four uh, brief quotes, and so you know, the definition would be one of those. All right, more questions. When is the research paper going to be due? Uh, let's check the syllabus. Six. What day is it? Pretty sure it's the sixth of November. Yeah, this one's due this Friday. I think it's due the the research so is due next the Friday. We can make that one due Saturday night, and then Sunday I can start grading them. I like to try to have. I'm getting four sets of research papers that week. And so week nine, I'm going to go through four different classes and try to grade all the research papers so that if there are any bad problems, uh, they can be fixed in week 10 before we're all out of here. And then you'll be done with your paper in time to study for other stuff for finals. You, you do not want to be writing your research papers during finals week. It's just, um, it's, it would be terrible. Uh, and a lot of people wind up doing that, but I, you know, to me, I don't want to grade all that much all at once. I like to grade, you know, half a class. Like I got 25 people in class. I want to grade 12 tonight, and 13 tomorrow night, and then 
12 more the next night, you know, and I can get through a whole class, you know, I mean, a whole four classes worth of papers, usually in a week, I'll, you know, so, you know, I'll try to get one class done in a day. Uh, the rest of them I'll split up over two days. Anyway, that's my reasoning. Any more questions? What was the other enumerations? We just let the internet define it, but if we wanted the proper definition, ugh, I should have plural. Here we go. Taking a census of uh, specifying serotonin. Ooh, what does that even mean? A catalog, a list. Well, none of these really match the use of um, I guess two. But then we need to know what area town is. One after another, one in succession. Okay, well, that's not so hard. So that's an enumeration. All right, any questions? Will we move on to other stuff? Dr. McGee, this is kind of, I've been reading about uh, the daddy poem by Plath, and right. this may be a question for another time but this is it. It, she um she had a lot of resentment towards a man that she knew for a very short period i mean she he died when uh she was eight right yes and i wonder if when she was at herself she was that way i've known like my family we have a lot of depression in it what i've noticed about depressed people is they tend to latch on to stuff that isn't really, you know, you're depressed when you're clinically depressed, you're depressed because of brain chemistry. Something's off in your brain, but you want to make sense of it. And so you find something to blame. Um, and so it can be FBI people in the bushes, or it can be your dad dying when you were 10 uh, and being a Nazi. Um, you, uh, um, it, um, it can come out in a number of ways that isn't really related to the depression. It's a symptom of the depression. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so that makes sense. I was just kind of reading through it like, man, <laughs> he really must have. <laughs> well, and a lot of people think he abused her. As far as we can tell, he did not. Uh, and mostly she's upset because he died when she was 10. But I don't know if when she's sane, which, you know, when she's at herself, when she's not clinically depressed, if she would have been that upset over him, or if this yeah, was- Yeah, because too, in the, that little interview she did with the, I think it was the BBC, where she said she had the Electra complex or whatever it was, where, and then you're like, wait a minute, you know, this is off from, <laughs> from the perception, but anyway. Well, that she desires her father, and therefore she is upset when he's gone, if that makes sense. If yeah. She feels like okay. he abandoned her. And that's a natural feeling, but what's not normal or average is for you to be carrying it 20 years later at that intensity. That's what's unusual. Most people work through and come to some kind of resolution with their feelings. Right. Like my father died uh, almost 20 years ago. And a lot of the feelings I had at the time, and uh, frankly, he died of suicide. Um, and you do feel abandoned and you do feel angry, but over time you, it's not something I wake up thinking about, right? And uh, you come to some kind of like, um, you know, acceptance is the word uh, Kubler-Ross uses. You get to the place where, okay, I'm moving on with my life. It's not going to affect the way I think about him for the rest of his life, you know? Uh, and I'm not going to be thinking about it all the time. 
I would have thought about it today if we hadn't been talking about this. Um, so uh, that's what's unusual is uh, the way it manifests during your periods of mental illness. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. That's my theory anyway. One thing I don't think I mentioned, but uh, at the time we talked about it, but uh, it's uh, be careful what you hate lest you become it because she was angry at her father for leaving her and abandoning her by dying. And then what does she do? She abandons her two small children by dying. Um, although, you know, it's both due to illness, but um, it's, it's a funny sort of thing. Okay, he's done this terrible thing and now I'm going to do it. All right, well, I'm going to open up the, well, let's stop sharing and stop recording.